All right, so welcome to Empowerment Liberation Cathedrals, Word Wednesday. Tonight, again, we are talking about, uh, our topic is justice. But tonight we want to talk about, uh, a little about what we heard on last night. Uh, we know that on last evening, we watched the first presidential debate. And so we wanna talk a little bit about that with our ELC leaders. We do know that it's important to um, understand what's going on in our country, what things will impact us, um, what changes might be coming, and how the leader uh, intends to implement certain things. And so last night we heard an earful. Uh, and after we talk about uh, some of the things that we heard, then we're gonna talk about some of the topics which they should have covered. All right, so I ask that at this time, you would hit share. At this time, you would hit like. At this time, you would create a watch party. We're gonna give everybody a few minutes to get on and I gotta uh, create that same watch party myself. So we're gonna ask that you take a few moments. Welcome, welcome, welcome to those who are joining us now. We're gonna ask that you take a few moments to- Welcome to- uh, we're going to ask that you take a few moments to hit like. We're going to ask that you take a few moments to share this uh, live stream to your pages. And we want you to create a watch party so that those who are connected to you can hear the wonderful information which we're going to share with you on tonight. All right. And so it's important to do that. And so we want to give everybody a few moments to be able to do that. Again, we always say, don't forget to follow us uh, on Facebook at Empowerment Liberation Cathedral. Follow us on YouTube at Empowerment Liberation Cathedral. And follow us on Instagram at Empower Cathedral. Follow us on Twitter at Empower Cathedral. And as always, please do make sure you follow and connect with our webpage. That's empowermentliberationcathedral.org. And um, we've been doing a lot of work um, you know, to make sure that we're bringing you information because we understand some people don't like to watch the news. We understand some people did not want to uh, watch uh, the event. I want to call it the event on last night. And so for those who did not, we are bringing some information to you on tonight. So again, we want you to make sure that you uh, hit share, hit like, and make sure you create a watch party. So at this time, we're gonna have our panelists tonight. We have our ELC leadership. We have with us Deacon Sylvester Stokes. We have with us Deacon Kim Hall. We have with us Deacon Ronnie Bullock. And we have Minister Catherine McKay and Page. All right, and so uh, I'm sure, uh, I think most of you, one person told me they didn't watch, but most of you did watch the, y'all know who the person is, uh, did watch the debate on last evening. And so um, I, I just wanna hear, first, we don't wanna go into the topics yet because I'm gonna ask y'all specifically about the topics, but while you were watching, what did you feel? What was your feeling? What 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 stirred your emotions? Were you embarrassed at all? And so let me hear from somebody about what they felt uh, during that event, as I call it, on last evening. Well, I'll tell you, um, I thought it was exhausting. Um, it felt like it was messy and exhausting, and it felt like um, arguing with an ex, okay, where you're not, I mean, honestly, that's what it felt like, like it was not saying anything, you're saying nothing, and just being loud, because you feel like if you're loud, then you're right, you know, so basically my one word, well, I'm going to give it two, is messy and exhausting. Wow, I, I, I like that arguing with the ex. I'm sure everybody can relate to that. Being loud and saying nothing. <laughs> Being loud and saying nothing. <laughs> okay, somebody else share with us how they felt. 
Well, initially, Bishop, I was excited. I, I had my watch party going on and I was excited and I thought some things were going to get talked about and settled. And I don't know why I thought that 45 was going to be on, on somewhat good behavior, right? But he missed the mark. So, of course, I started yelling at the moderator, telling him to turn off his mic. I'm like, turn his mic off, turn his mic off. What is wrong with you? Why aren't you moderating? So I got mad at him, at Chris Wallace first. Then I got mad at Joe because he wasn't answering the questions from the moderator. Every time 45 would jump in, he would respond to 45's questions. Yes. So that made me angry at Joe. And of course, all, all I got to do is look at 45 and I'm just pissed off at him. So I was just, by the time I hung up, I mean, I'm not so much of a drinking person, but I, I needed a glass of wine or something to calm my nerves because it was the absolute worst. It was a mess. And I'm glad that you brought up the fact that the moderator was not uh, doing uh, uh, the best job. He really wasn't. And I said, now, how can the folks in church know how to hit the mic button, turn it off, bring it all the way down or something? Or take it out of his hand. Yeah, you don't even know how to turn the mic. I mean, if you shut him down, you know, he's going to have to change his behavior. And uh, then Joe, yes, I observed the same thing, that Joe got sidetracked numerous times by this person shouting from across the room. And so, you know, uh, and then uh, numerous times, Chris didn't even allow him to finish his thought. You know, uh, what were you starting to say before 45 started shouting some other things? Okay. So, you know, it, it yes, okay. I'm gonna keep my comments to the end, okay, Deacon? So I would say that it was a complete utter mess. That's exactly what it was. It was yeah. an embarrassment to the United States of America. Um, it was an embarrassment to um, just our effort to create humanity and justice and equality um, to support certain policies that actually will help society, help the people. Um, none of that was brought up for. I just actually, I, I'm not surprised at 45's behavior. Um, I expect it, hopefully expect it, that it'll be a little different because of this. Um, but even the entrance, um, when he entered the stage, he had this sour look on his face and it never changed. And I was like, wow, that's not good. Yeah, um, I, I think I wasn't surprised, but I was disappointed if I could say it that way because you know we were hopeful that his people had worked with him enough that he would you know be a little bit more controlled and uh i guess that's as, as deacon ronnie said that was a wild goat there and so <laughs> it was no controlling no controlling that one no taming him no nothing uh but i i just thought it was truly an embarrassment um and to know that everybody or most people tuned in because they wanted to see and hear would there be anything that would you know change their point of view and it was exhausting i did see some people say they just went ahead and signed off or turned it off because they could not continue to watch um you know it, it's unfortunate that we had to experience that from the person who's supposed to be at the top of the chain in the united states of america mr cat well what i want to say that what i've read in the comments um and um ronnie watch party last night i did um tune in for some and um i love her comments and um comments that everybody made like i said bishop said that set one that one is actually me um her and i talked about it today that i watch it and really i just be honest with you um it makes me frustrated and upset because i know that he throw tantrum tantrum tantrums okay. and um temple tantrums and i can't exalt that Exhaust is it exhausting? Just like you know, um, um, Deacon Kim said, and you know, on a mental health standpoint, I, that that's like child behavior, and I'm not sure why they have not spanked him or put him in the corner yet because this is ridiculous. You know how um he performs, and I'm just saying that it, it, it's just an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment. I read the newspaper articles. I read the news. I watched the news. I'm like, I I'm just glad because I would have been upset and more frustrated trying to go to bed last night. And like um, Deacon Ronnie said, what was resolved? 
You know, what was the end for all ends? You know, a lot of questions, like you say, he was very distracted with arguing with this other individual, like arguing with an ex. You know, and only thing you hear is Charlie Brown, womp, 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 <laughs> and then you turn them off lately. But, you know, he just should have turned them off a long time ago. So um, that's all I wanted to say on that behalf. But no, I did not tune in. However, I saw the comments blowing up on my feed and I read um, the news this morning. So I got it. Okay. And so let me ask now, uh, when you talk about debates and you um, go into uh, discussion uh, on different topics, do we ever feel like it's fair game to bring up someone else's uh, child or even if it's an adult child? Is that right to do? Well, um... Let me give the instance. We know Chuck talked about Joe's son. Hunter. Yes. So Bishop, I would have to say absolutely no. Though that's, that is um, off the table. That has nothing to do with the presidential race whatsoever. Your children, don't, don't talk about your kids. I don't care if they're grown or not. I don't care you know, what, his, what, what, what they did or what they didn't do, um, I think is off the table. And I think Joe Biden did take an awesome stance by saying the kids are off the table because he could have started with Ivanka and, and ended with Barron, to be quite frank with you, yes. you know, but he was very respectful in that instance. And I appreciated him by saying, yes, my son was a drug addict but I'm proud of him because he's no longer there. So that just shut him right down. But I don't think talking about my mama, don't talk about my mama, don't talk about my kids, don't talk about my wife. But yeah. you know what I'm saying, but I, I think that should have been off the table. But Trump, Trump's main goal was to bring up Hunter. He had his goal. He wasn't going to debate. I mean, I'm going off, I'm going off topic. Let me leave it there. But the, the, the response to your question is no. I, I think, yes, I think all children should be off the table. That's, that's just one of those things you just don't do. Right, right. Anybody else want to comment on that? Sure, for I, me. Go ahead, Deacon Sylvester, then we'll come to Minister Yeah, sure. For me, uh, family, children, whatever, totally off the table. It was definitely a form of deflection. Um, in terms of answering the appropriate question and having an appropriate answer. Yes. yes I mean, you know, like um, Deacon Ronnie said, I believe he did that to, you know, take him out of his thought process and um, from what the real topics and the real questions should have been asked at that time, because America is looking for answers. And we don't have to wait for those answers to come until Barack Obama jump up and he say something or he post something you know, for us to get that little spark and like, oh, there's hope, you know? So, you know, I just think that it, it should have been more focused and versed around that. And, you know, I mean, come on, that was so, such a low blow and it was so embarrassing and so hurtful. And, you know, you just don't do that. I mean, where is it humane and all that? I mean, you just don't do that. And we get on our kids for doing stuff like that, you know? And what are we saying to America when our children and our, our kids are watching this stuff? Our grandbabies are watching this debate. And we encourage them to sit in because this is history. Oh my God, this is something big that's happening. But yet they come out with just that, you know? Yeah. So where do you draw the line as the person? Yeah, I agree. Go ahead, Mr. I agree. I think, um, I think when it comes to the presidential race, anything that doesn't have anything to do with holding that office and what you will do in holding that office or the cabinet you'll bring or the change that you'll bring, I just think it's all off limits. Like, I, I, I definitely don't think his, um, what his child did in regards to money um, should have been discussed. But then you're gonna talk about the child's condition, like an, an addiction at the child. And I mean, he's a grown man, but he's still that man's child. You know what I mean? And so you're, you're bringing into play something that has nothing to do with anything. If anything, what he did at that moment was showed a compassionate father saying yes, and I supported my son through it. And yes, my son made it through it. And then he looked at the screen and he said, we all had, you know what I mean? But um, honestly, he grabbed at everything. You know what, he grabbed at everything that he knew Joe Biden was too big of a man to come back at him with because he wasn't going to touch that man's children. 
it's not appropriate. Uh, I totally agree. I um, what I saw was first insult to injury. Uh, you know, he insulted him in a place where it was really going to hit him and where it was really going to hurt. Uh, but also, um, I think he was baiting him, you know, trying to get him off his game and make sure he was so emotional about what had been said about his son that he would not be focused and, you know, he would get caught up in that space. And that is a tactic that people use to try to get you off focus. And so I think it's important uh, to realize that that was intentional. And I think Deacon Ronnie was about to say it, that was intentional to bring that up so that he could then drive on the street about the, um, you know, his condition, but then about the money. Okay. And so, um, you know, we have to just be mindful that uh, family members should always be off limits. And I said, okay, now, if he say anything about this man's dead wife, uh, deceased wife and deceased daughter, I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk to, I'm going to go to Cleveland. <laughs> so, you know, because that just would have been totally, totally off limit, but not out of character for Trump. And so I, I just feel that, you know, when we get into those type of discussions, family members should always be off limit. Um, and then also, is it okay to incite racist uh, supremacist groups uh, and kind of talk in code because you know they're watching, but is that something that we want to see in a leader, uh, a person who is the leader of our country? Let's talk about that because clearly there was an undertone that maybe some folks missed. I know y'all didn't miss it, but some oh, folks might have missed it. So let, let's talk about that because clearly even Chris said, well, what you gonna tell them to do? What are they supposed to be gonna stand by to do? So let's talk about that. I think the fact that he said under his breath, battle boys, stand by. If you know anything about the Ku Klux Klan, that's what they called them. They called them battle boys. And they would call the battle boys and send them out in the trucks. And those are the ones that went and got whoever they were gonna lynch, burn, castrate or whatever. They called them battle boys. This man on public TV in the United States of America told the battle boys to stand by and trust me, they listened. There is no way that yeah. you should be able to say that and still be a, a pub, hold a public office. This man said, that, I mean, I'm telling you, anybody watching this, look up battle boys when it comes to the KKK. Those are the groups that they sent out. And this it's man called, told them to stand by. And yeah. it's called Proud Boys. They're called Proud Boys. Yeah. yeah. And, and just to piggyback on what you, you just said, they have now added to their logo yes um, stand back who was it stand back or, or stand, back, stand back stand down stand by stand back stand down stand, stand right so that is they have now added that to their logo they so, did that last night they did that last night that's right as soon as he said it they probably was like new logo and uh, and they can say um by President Trump Obama, I mean, by, by President uh, Donald J. Trump. That's who said that. So that's who coined their phrase. Yeah. Did y'all yeah. notice that that was the first time that he was at a loss for words because he sat there and tried to feign ignorance? Like, I don't know any names of any white supremacist groups, but I can tell you all of the leftist names. You know, give me a name. Come right. on, please. Right. You know. Right. <laughs> right. Right. right, and also when he, uh, I think it's the best. Hold on, when he said, "Give me what you want me to say." What do you want me to say? What you want me to oh, say? Oh, in other words, I'm not really saying this. I'm just repeating what you want me to mm -hmm. say, so that I won't be held accountable because I can just tell the public or I can tell these groups. Oh, I just said that. You know, that's because he he wanted me to say that, but that's not really what I wanted to say. No, what I was going to say is that I didn't think that was talking in code at all. I thought it was very blatant. It was very open and direct. I I know because I listened to some of the um, shows afterwards and some of the commentators were trying to support, well, that's not really what he meant. That was very obvious because you could have chosen other words, but you chose those specific words. And so 
it's just like Minister Eliana. I, I just could not believe that on public TV in front of the whole world, I had a friend of mine call me from Canada and it's like, what was that? We know exactly what it was. Yeah. So it, it's, once again, it's an embarrassment, but it's a large portion of the atmosphere that we're living in, which is unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. My but sister I, said she also, oh, I'm sorry, on my um, watch, my sister said she also saw that they are now putting t-shirts out um, and it's appearing, yeah. yeah. Of course they are. Of course they are. But I say in in um, support of those people who uh, maybe uh, did not grow up or in a time uh, where there was so much tension between the races and they uh, are kind of, I don't want to say, um, you know, unfamiliar with certain terminology, but there's a block of people that uh, are not familiar with certain things. While it might've been blatant to some, some people did not get it. And so, you know, unfortunately, there's always people in our community who don't get it. They miss it and we say, how could you have missed it? But there's always people in our community who, who don't get it and don't pick up on it until someone else tells them. And so that's why we're saying, you know, uh, for some it was blatant and for some it was a code that, um, you know, naturally a certain community would know and would then be energized from. And so we saw the energy um, come together. And uh, as Deacon Ryan just said, they're making shirts. I knew that, um, you know, when I saw that they had added his statement, I said, oh, now they're about to really uh, accelerate what they were going to do. And so right now, uh, which I'm gonna come right back to you, Deacon Kim, right now, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, there to me is an underground movement happening. Uh, and we're gonna really have to deal with this and figure this out because we are going to have, it appears to be some type of war in this country if we're not careful and if we don't stop this. Uh, Deacon Kemp. Or was it Mr. Kent? I think it was Mr. Kent. Okay. I, I just, um, you know, you guys know I do mental health and I love mental health. And um, do y'all realize, you know, I have so much to say. You understand? And do y'all realize that we are, we, the United States is not in a good place right now. You know, and it bothers me because we have our children, our grandchildren, we have, you know, our young babies who are watching these displays of, you know, um, um, crap, you know, that's what it is. And, you know, and just what Bishop said, you know, I can't wait till she gets to the second part because I witnessed this with her. We are in for something. And if we don't be ready, you understand, I mean, this is this this is something that's something is gonna happen, you know, and we just need to be ready as a people, you know, because I'm telling you, we are the most hated race again, you know, they I mean, I don't understand. I don't understand, but you know, mental health is something else. Mental illness is something else. Mental illness is something else. And it and and look what we got. Look what we got out of this. It, it's crazy. All of this has come from people being upset about a black president. You know, some of it, not all of it, because hatred is always. Yeah, the, yeah, absolutely, Bishop. And the fear, I think, you know, we were actually talking about this on class last night. It's, it's the fear that if you really look at the ratios, we outnumber you. So yeah. the fact that you have a level of power because you have the protection of certain entities, yeah. number to number, we outnumber you. But before that, before we even outnumbered you, you are more afraid of our power and the light that shows through us yeah. because we're not a people that you can keep down that you need to figure out a way to handle us. And the sad part is we're not those people. We right. have the most, which is sometimes, you know, my wife pisses my wife off, excuse my language, but we're the most forgiving group of people ever. Yeah. We will forgive people and they continually tear us apart. And, you know, my wife has, she, you know, we, we talk honest. We're speaking honest on here. We are the most forgiving people, but you want to tear us down simply because you can't stand the fact of the power that comes with us. It's inherent. We didn't, we didn't ask to be this way. We were bred this way. This is how we are made. And yeah. for whatever reason, your fear of that 
is what causes this. And the, and the thing about it is when you deal with a race that can, that can make it through anything, yeah. years of enslavement, years of all of that, we can make it through anything. You don't deal with us in fear. That's a dangerous place for you to be. It, yeah. it really is. And I, you know, I won't go any, but it's a dangerous place for you to be. And Minister Catch, you're absolutely right. Um, we need to get ready and we need to understand what's coming our way. But the thing about it is we're no longer scared. Right. And I want to talk with, about that, but let me just respond to one thing you said. Truly, we are a resilient people. And as much as they've tried to take us out, tear us down, we always manage to come back. You know, it's like that, uh, the, um, what is it, the punching bag and some of the other dolls you have, time you knock it down, it comes back. It, it's always coming back. We always coming back. Ain't nothing nobody can do about it. That's our DNA. But the 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 strange piece to all of this is that uh, the fear that the whites felt they need to put in blacks. Because if blacks really knew who they were doing slavery, blacks would have known that we were the majority because they had to bring in all of these people to uh, you know, help to amass this West wealth they were trying to create here in the United States and the labor that was needed. So there were more laborers, the people of color, than the people who were doing the hiring or, or the people who were the slave masters. Let me say it that way. So if we really knew who we were back then, it would have been a great takeover. But because of what they were telling us, because of them instilling fear in us, because of them taking people out and hanging them, because of them beating people with the whips, you know, on the plantations and all of that, then they, in essence, made themselves to be greater or to be the supreme person over us. And so we've carried that on for generations. But in actuality, we are the superstars. We're the people with the great intelligence. Uh, we're the people who have the resiliency and we're the people who have the great minds. You've seen all the things that we've built, all the things that we've created, all the things that we have designed and all the things they have stolen from us. And so there's something about us that we got to get. We have yet to get it that makes us great, but yet and still we allow people to tell us that we're not. And so until we can get it, uh, I don't know that we're going to come into a different place. You know, but unfortunately, uh, they have, uh, um, you know, I guess use that to their favor that we don't know who we are. Right. Well, Bishop, you know, I, I agree with you and um, Eliana. Um, but one addition to that is that we are no longer our ancestors. Absolutely. So we're no, fr we're, we're no longer afraid to slap the crap out of you if you say something to us. We're, you know, we're not those people anymore. We have, we may, may be still stuck in some kind of box where, you know, we, we just all can't get together like other national races or other, um, like the Chinese, they all, or the, the Chinese, they all get together. You know, the, 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 um, the, the Spanish people, they all get together. For whatever reason, we can't all come together because everybody wants to be at the top and don't nobody tell me what to do. You know, and that probably comes from um, us being enslaved and so on and so forth. But the one thing about the Caucasians or the people, the races and so on, is that they know that if you say something or do something to us, that we will definitely retaliate. We are not our ancestors anymore. No, we are not. No, we are not. And thank God for it. I have a question, though. Okay. So if Deacon Sylvester, did you want to say something? No, I was just saying that was a good point that she made. Okay. Okay. Deacon Kim. So so when you say resiliency is in our DNA, so do you think like um hatred, evilness is in their DNA? I want to remain silent, <laughs> but if y'all can look at my face. Okay, so <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. I don't want to be on record saying anything, okay? <laughs> but, but I think, I mean, but Bishop, honestly, culture is passed down from generation to generation. And our resiliency was passed down. We sang songs from the motherland while we were being taught English and their rules. Yeah. So our resiliency was is passed down to us. A baby, you know, it's, it's in us because it's been bred in us for many, 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 many generations. When you think about that, 
you have to realize that that parent that's raising that child is teaching that child hatred. But there's so many people of, that are white that will tell that parent or uncle or brother, that don't sit well with me. That yeah. doesn't make me feel right. But there are still other people that they won't say it. So yeah. if you got two brothers raised in the same house and one co-signs with the KKK father and the other one's like, something don't feel right. It has to be some type of fertile ground for you to accept that. And yeah. it passed down. If you're, if you're, you know, it, it, it goes just like abuse. You know what I mean? If you're raised in an abusive household, you think that's what's supposed to look like. So you keep think going. it's cultural. Like you said, I do. I think, I I think, think it's it is cultural. cultural. Yeah. Because, I think it's definitely cultural. You know, because I think it doesn't hit all, everybody. But also, I think the problem is the difference with cultural for us and cultural for people uh, that are um, that are white um, is they don't see when there is privilege and when there isn't. Now, that ain't cultural. That's just how you made that you can't see because we go up in the store and they follow me and I'm your good girlfriend. We came in together. They follow me. They ain't following you. And yeah. you don't see nothing wrong with that. That's how you made. That's not cultural. Right. I'm glad you made the difference because I think there is a difference. Cultural is uh, learned or your environment um, or, you know, what you kind of have seen and been around. But I think as I was stating for DNA, there's something in you that you cannot explain, but it makes you just be resilient in all of your, you know, situations that arise. And so I do think if you have a very strong warrior, you know, we came from a lot of warriors, um, you know, in Africa and so many other uh, places across the continent, um, you know, we have that strong warrior spirit, but you ain't never had to war for nothing. And so now where does that come from? It's coming from somewhere that comes from your great, great, great grandfather, great, great grandmother that you never met, but it's in you. And somebody may even come up to you and say, you know, you remind me of so-and-so and so-and-so, but you ain't never met that person. So that's what I mean. We have that resilience that's in our DNA. There's something in us that we, you know, it's just there. And uh, I think it's something in the white race too, that's just there that, you know, um, it rises up on, on certain occasions. Okay, I do want us to get to, um, you know, on the tail end of that, uh, I was gonna talk about how it seems to me, you know, we talked about the Proud Boys. Uh, it seems to me that there's some type of, and I, 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 it may not even be underground. It may be as deep as Sylvester said, it might be blatant and some of us just don't know about it. But it seems to me that there's something going on in the United States that needs to be discussed, I believe, or brought to, the, brought to the forefront on the news. There is a selling out of ammunition, uh, any type of handgun, uh, shotgun, any of those things that you might be, uh, you know, have in your possession. If you have not looked online or if you have not been in some of the gun stores, those things are out of stock. Now, why are they out of stock? Is there something going on? The reason that ammunition is flying off the shelves? Is there something going on? The reason that ammunition is on a lot of the uh, websites uh, sold out? And then, um, you know, uh, a lot of the guns, the handguns, rifles are sold out online. They're sold out in some of the stores. And some of the store owners are saying they don't know when they're gonna get certain things in because time they come in, they uh, sell it the same day. So is there something going on? Is there something uh, that people are getting prepared for? Something that people are getting ready for? You know, and, and so I want us to really talk about that because I appreciate the fact that Deacon Ronnie said, we ain't our ancestors, honey. Uh, we're going to be ready too. And I believe that the black folks are buying some of these guns and buying some of this ammunition because they're going to be ready too. Absolutely. But we have to know that there's something going on. The reason that all of the, not all, but a lot of the ammunition that is created in this country, and it may be in other places too, but that is sold here in the U.S. cannot stay stocked. Well, Bishop, I think you said it. I mean, um, before was the time it was only one group of people that were preparing and preparing to bear arms. Now, it's everybody. The only difference is there, there are those of us, and you know, those of us that come from 
areas where we could buy it out of a trunk. Those aren't the only groups of us that are now armed. There's some, there are more, there's another group that is going to classes that is getting, you know, licenses and they're getting their weapons legally, just like our counterparts have gotten their weapons legally. Yeah. See, the, the other part about it, and, and, you know, if we want to be, you know, transparent about it, you really need to, anybody that's coming out right now acting a fool needs to be afraid. Because when we as a people stop going to trunks and we start going to stores, you got two armies coming. So, yeah, I think it is something happening. And I think everybody's preparing. And that's because racism has reared its head again. And we're not having it. But when we look at that, if everybody's preparing, what has happened to push us to this place that we feel like we need to get prepared? What is going on in our country that we feel like, oh, no, I got to go buy me a gun. I need a weapon. You know, we got people buying weapons now who've never bought weapons before. We got people, like you said, going to classes that never felt a need to go to a class to be trained on uh, gun safety and how to properly shoot a gun. And so what is happening in the conscience of this country or in the minds of the people that make people say, oh, no, it's time? Well, well, Bishop, I think that people are afraid of the unknown. I think okay. that I think that they feel like something is happening or because the the lawyers come outside with the guns in their hands, I'm peacefully marching and they come out on their front with their guns in the hands ready to shoot me. I may need to be prepared for something like that. I don't quite know, but if they can do that, I may need to be able to do the same thing. So let me get myself together just in case somebody wants to come and harm me and my family. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm just speaking for myself. I don't think, I don't know if people think a war is coming. I, don't, I just think people are afraid of what could potentially happen, but not really know what it is, but they know that we have somebody in office that are, that is inciting these other groups and these other groups they don't have those 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 hoods on anymore. They just coming out and saying, I hate y'all. Yep. And I hate y'all and we all gonna come together and whatever whatever we wanna do, we gonna do. So us as us as a people who we weren't used to having guns and weapons or, you know, not unless you were down south and you were shooting the squirrels and, you know, <laughs> things like that. But us city folks, we weren't used to can't having guns in our houses or you know, mama might have a butcher knife under her mattress or something like that, right? Just in case somebody slip up and come in the house. <laughs> but we're not, we weren't used to that. But now we're like, hmm, something is not right. So let me get prepared for whatever that thing may be. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I think, I think what it is now, these groups, they were always underground. Now they have a spokesman. And that's how they feel. You know, he co-signs onto what they believe. And now, you know, it's like, we don't have to hide anymore. So let's just be out and open, like you said. Um, and just, you know, our hatred is not um, disguised anymore. It's just right out there in the open, right. you know? So, yeah. yeah. Right. And I think that there's two parts to this. Uh, one, because of the shortages of guns and ammunition is that one part is that you have those people purchasing because of the direct intent to harm, but also think that um, there's a large percentage of people as well that are afraid and they, we don't know what's happening. I, yeah, I, I feel there's a current of something that's going to happen. However, last night after the debate, there was one of the commentators that said to one of his friends, um, text him and said that the 11 year old son was watching the debate. And after 45 made that statement about stand back, stand by, he said to his mother, should we get a gun to protect ourselves? That's an 11 year old. Yeah. And so can you imagine what adults, and Minister Cat alluded to it earlier, what adults are thinking? Yeah. And whether you're bright, black, brown, green, or whatever, uh, there's a lot of fear. And people react what kind of way when they're fear? Not rationally. That's right. You're and right. I, I, I trust in the police department. That doesn't help. 
Yeah, and you know, we talked about that the other week, how a lot of people changed, uh, traded in their white hoods for blue uniforms. And so, you know, with the unleashing, uh, because I do believe that he has, uh, 45 has released or unleashed some type of spirit uh, and has made it okay to be hateful, made it okay to discriminate, made it okay to uh, say that you are supreme or you are better and your supremacy organization or your supremacist organization is okay to have and be a part of and participate in, you know, with that spirit, then you got people, yes, who are no longer uh, underground. They've come up and said, we're gonna be in your face. And so that's kind of where they are. And it, it just seems like to me, or it kind of feels like at election day, if not before, something is going to happen, you know? And so, um, you know, it, it seems like he has people on standby in case he's not the uh, person who comes out as the winner. Well, he and said it, stand by. This is, exactly. This is, stand this, by. Is so, this is so ridiculous, you know? And um, as Dick, Dick and Ronnie said, you know, people are preparing for the unknown. You know, because they don't understand, you know, what, can, well, they do understand, you know, but because they don't know what is going to go left or right, you understand? And I know the Second Amendment of the Constitution told us to bear arms. You know what? My brother and I had a discussion. He was like, you know what? When they put that out there, it's for us to get guns and bear arms against the state. You understand? Because those are the folks who make the laws and didn't want to break them and didn't want to do all those things to them and then they want to come for us. But the, the fear factor is for me is that when you can murder someone's child in broad daylight, I'm talking about police officers, you know, on television where everybody is looking and everybody's watching and people are standing by saying, you can't breathe, he can't breathe, help him. When all this stuff was happening, people are afraid. People are buying 10 guns, 15 guns. Shoot, I'm going to get some. You understand? So, you know, I, and I'm so serious. We, you know, we need to, we, this is the time that we need to bear arms. So many of us feel that we need to bear arms now, but a lot of us ain't going to admit to it, but I'm going to admit to it. When you are watching the news and you are seeing so much that is happening throughout the United States of America, you know, what else for you to think when an 11 year old is saying that we're going to buy guns? When a 12 year old or a six year old, five year old says, should we be afraid for our life? You understand? When, should you be afraid? You understand? It's it just, a, it just, it, this is a movement that's going to happen, whether we want it to happen or not, y'all. And like Deacon Ronnie said, I love the way she said it, that we are not our ancestors. We fight back. We got the lip. We got all that. We ain't going to take nothing from nobody, you know, and that's who we are. So, well, let me, dot let, com. Let me add, let me add, um, when we talk about we're not our ancestors, the church folk got guns too. Let me just make that very clear because um, growing up, I did grow up in the South. I grew up in uh, Birmingham, uh, Alabama, and I grew up in the city, yes, but my grandmother always had a gun and she was always sitting uh, on the, I guess, behind the first lady in the church. And she was one of the well-respected mothers in the church, <laughs> but it was nothing for her to carry her gun in her purse, carry her gun. It would be in the front seat of the car, under the seat and uh, anywhere else she wanted to take it. And so that was before all the regulations were put in place for us, because I believe the regulations were put in place for us. You know, we talk about Carrie and all of that, but um, you know, and some of her friends in the church had guns too. So I just want to put it out there that the church folks uh, are not above having uh, weapons, you know, as well. And it's just important to know uh, that people who feel a need to protect themselves are moving now to do exactly that. And so I believe that's the move we're seeing. But I did want to talk about how the ammunition, uh, you look on those sites and stuff, and um, they're, they're just sold out. And you go into the stores and you look on the sites for uh, handguns, for rifles, uh, those things are sold out. So we want to know and be aware that there is something that is happening. And so, you know, I believe that God will always uh, bring things to the forefront that we need to know about and get ready for. Um, another thing is the Supreme Court, um, you know, Trump's handling of that particular question when they talked about the Supreme Court nominee was definitely not one that um, 
was an answer of intelligence. Let me say it that way. Um, so we understand that uh, the nominee, uh, Judge Amy Barrett, um, I believe the the hearings will start October 12th. I believe that's the week they're going to start those hearings. And it is their goal to try to have her confirm before uh, the end of October. And so, um, you know, Trump's comment was that they won the presidency. And he even, I believe, tried to bring in our late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's statement, which I know was used incorrectly. Uh, but what do we think about, you know, him saying, well, since he won, he should be able to, you know, put somebody on the court, you know, because I believe President Barack Obama had won uh, some years ago, too, and he should have been able to put somebody on the court. So when we talk about who won the office, it, does it not apply for everybody who's won the office? I'm just asking the question because it just seemed to me that things totally changed because Trump won versus when President Obama had won. I don't know how they sleep at night, to be honest with you. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> I mean, when he, because just like you said it, when when he said we won, like didn't Barack Obama win too? So how, like at, the only thing I wish Joe Biden had done yesterday was interrupt him and say those things. And that would have really ticked him off because when he said we won the White House, so did he. And so what's the difference? You know, I mean, oh, God, like I said, I don't know how they sleep at night with the hypocrisy, you know, all of it. And, and then I just off point, but like I was looking at Lindsey Graham crying on TV. He's out raising me. His opponent is out raising him and funds and I need money. And I'm like, good, <laughs> right? Because, um, you know, he went back on his word. So it's just like the just the hypocrisy among them is just incredible. I wouldn't be able to sleep at I, I think for um, this issue, um, they're saying, so when, when Obama was in office, he was on his fourth term. I mean, he was in um, his fourth year. And they said they want the people to elect the um, sitting Supreme Court justice, the, the next one. So that's why they didn't want him to put his, his uh, nominee out there. Um, although it's 11 months out, they wow. wanted, that's right, they wanted the people to select the ju the Supreme Court justice. Yes. That's why he couldn't. Yes. And then when they did um, uh, Lindsey Graham, was it Lindsey Graham? Yeah, when Lindsey Graham said, you know, hold the tape that we're going to do the same with Trump. Um, and, and he's like two months out, you know, it's like, he, he said, oh, they keep playing that over and over again, hold the tape, hold the tape, hold the tape, because the people want to vote in or, you know, have some say in the next Supreme Court justice, right? And so we all know the reason why Trump wants to pull this woman in, because she is total opposite of RGB, R -R -B -G, RBG. She's total opposite of her. She believes in everything opposite. She's white on the right and she's, you know, um, RBG is on the left. So he has, and he, and he thinks she's going to uphold when it's time for them to, um, when they pick the person, because I don't think there's gonna be a winner on November 3rd. And right. so she's gonna be the one, she's already gonna be in office. She's going to be the one who has the vote to say, okay, Trump, you are now, you know, the president, because I feel like it's going to go on. It's not going to be, you know, he's a winner, Trump is a winner, or Biden is a winner. So, and, and on top of that, I think Biden, to your response, Kim, he probably was, he probably had so much going on his head with Trump saying this and saying that and all over the place and not staying on topic. He really didn't know what to answer. He didn't know whether he should have responded to the moderator or if he should have responded to Trump. So he probably was like, okay, I'm gonna put a penny there. I'm gonna come back there and then I'm gonna bring this up. Okay, I'm gonna put a penny there and I'm gonna bring that up. So, you know, some things just slipped right past him because it was just so much going on. But, you know, we all know that the reason why Trump is doing all of this is for his own gain. That's, that's just simple as that. And he, he has released the demons yes. of this earth. 
Yes. That's what I think. It's, I think it's been, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Mister. I think um, I think we're here because we didn't understand what our vote meant. I think we were more concerned on the presidency than we were on the House and the Senate. Because had we exercised our right to vote and placed the right people in the House and the Senate, I don't care what Trump says, we would have put whoever we wanted in that um, seat and we would have held it to the next because we would have had that power. I think um, we have to get away from looking for that one person that's going to save our political system. And the more we do that, this is what we ended up with. Because we always trust, as a country, we trusted that one person to be honest. We trusted that one person to have ethics and to have morals. Um, and now we see we actually have to put rules on our presidency. You know what I mean? And and I think, I don't think it's right that he's about to do this, but you know, sometimes what people do are a result of what we did not do. And we did not take those seats seriously. And um, now we realize how much we should have. Um, but, you know, we are people of faith. So I still believe that no matter what it looks like, no matter what it smells like, we can trust that it will end up the way it's supposed to end up. Um, but I, I just think right now we're just dealing with the repercussions of what we should have done. Right, I, I, I agree. And uh, I do want to give credit to those uh, social justice or justice organizations who did try to warn us and remind us how important it is to vote for the entire ballot, remind us to make sure that we read and look at the addendums and referendums that come out and remind us to make sure that we take everybody to the poll. And oftentimes they put out a ballot to suggest to you some things to consider when it comes to voting and you know possible ways to vote. So I do wanna give credit to those organizations because they do their job. Oftentimes we just ain't paying attention and we, we're not, you know, uh, mindful of what they are encouraging us to do. And so, you know, it, it's important that yes, we take responsibility, but we also get ourselves together and know going forward, some things have to change. We can now no longer do things the same way. And I do believe that, you know, um, I, I appreciate Deacon Kim bringing up Lindsey Graham, because we talked about how uh, he's being challenged as well as Mitch McConnell. I believe if the people keep the pressure on those two people, they will be removed out of those seats. And uh, we'll get other people who represent us or can represent our ideas or who have us at the forefront of their uh, campaign and what they plan to do in office, they will be able to get those seats to make a difference. And so, um, you know, we just have to really, really be mindful. And I think it's important too, Ms. Eliana, uh, that we look at people's platforms. What are they saying? Trump is doing basically what he said he wanted to do. And so if we hear somebody say they're going to do that kind of stuff, then we ought to be motivated to get out and vote. Uh, but, you know, sometimes we sleep on different things. And that's why I said I don't want to sleep on the fact that all the ammunition is going off the shelves and all the handguns and, and rifles are leaving the shelves, too, because something is happening. And so we want to, you know, stay woke. Uh, but I do think we have to stay encouraged as people of God and as, you know, uh, voices uh, that God often uses to speak to the people. We want to stay encouraged and make sure we encourage the people. In Micah 6, 8, uh, it says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. So what does the Lord require of you? And here it says to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And so now have, have the people who, um, you know, we look to, have they been acting justly? You know, uh, and I think there's so much fear in this country that people are afraid to do the right thing. And so, you know, sometimes you just got to step out on faith and trust God and say, you know, I'm going to do the right thing and God's going to keep me. God's going to cover me. And, you know, I, I just think that, you know, we're, we're 
dealing with in this country, people who have been put in positions and entrusted uh, by our vote, because we've entrusted some people to do certain things and they are not living up to what we entrusted them to do. Now, when I was uh, in Detroit, we, uh, an organization that I work with, we always said, hey, you don't go and do what we entrusted you to do, what we put you in office to do, you can go. We're going we're gonna to replace you. We're going to vote you out and put somebody else in. And some of these people need to know, we'll vote you out and put somebody else in. I think that's what Lindsey Graham is saying, because he promised not to uh, support putting a, a nomination out there or having these hearings. And so now he's actually going against what he told the people. So the people need to make it clear, you got to go, Lindsey. You know, and Mitt Romney, I was very surprised at Mitt Romney, but Mitt Romney, the people need to make it clear, Mitt, uh, you're going to have to go too. And we see Collins, um, I forget what state Collins represents, but Collins, uh, I think she she might stand on the right side of history this time, because we know she stood on the wrong side of history last time uh, when it came to um, Kavanaugh. And so, you know, they caused her to give in. But I do think that, you know, she might uh, do the right thing this time. So we'll see. But we have to let people know if you don't do the right thing, there's still the power of the vote. And we need to recognize the power of the vote and realize that we can remove people from office just like we put them in. Right. And I think people get discouraged, Bishop, because they don't realize that they have, you know, the vote counts, you know, just like what happened with Hillary and Trump, you know back back in 2016 I was like well I voted but you know she still lost you know but people just sometimes don't fear that the their their power is in voting and you know I think a lot of people a lot of media is getting out go out and vote everybody con is consciously saying vote 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 yeah. so you know the more we put it out there the more people will try to understand okay yeah maybe my vote will count this time you know, so if people would get out there and do what they need to do, it's going to take a minute for us to get back where we need to get to, but at least we won't be in this predicament that we've been in for the last four years. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I got a couple of more things I wanted to talk about before we get off. Now, we know last night they were supposed to talk about uh, election integrity. So now when we look at that, there were a couple of things that were discussed. Now I give Joe props because Joe brought it out that 45 mails in his ballot. Okay, now the main person talking about mail in ballots and all of that, okay. Donald Trump mails in his ballot to Florida. Okay, so now the, the, the taking away, the removal of the post office collection boxes, uh, putting locks on the uh, postal collection boxes and all of that, he has to mail in his ballot too to Florida. Okay. So Joe brought that out. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Trump is mailing in the ballot. <laughs> Had no clue. Yeah. So Joe actually brought that out last yeah. night, Joe Biden. Uh, but then, you know, uh, Donald Trump wants to bring out the fact that uh, I guess there were numerous ballots supposedly uh, with his name on it. Uh, people were selling ballots. I think he said down in West Virginia, he said that they found ballots in uh, the streams, the rivers and stuff like that. You know, he had all of these things that he was saying to try to discourage people. His thing, his point that he kept driving uh, was you need to request your ballot and then mail it back. So don't just have the states where, you know, the state mails it out to everybody like the District of Columbia did this time. Don't use that process because that's where the, um, the challenges are going to come in. You have to actually request a ballot. So it, it, it was... I don't know, it wasn't validated to me, his argument. So anybody want to talk about the uh, ballot, mail-in ballot process? So Bishop, I don't, under, I don't understand. He wants, he wants people to request the ballots and not just the states to mail them. Right. What, what, what's the difference, I mean. <laughs> Basically, don't just go down the role that you have as the uh, elections, um, you know, board, um, you know, the people, you need to receive something from every person who wants a ballot and send it back to them. 
he's trying to say they send out all these duplicate ballots and they send out stuff that's not right and which is there's no truth to that because you know the people have continued to say uh, that there's no truth to that some of those states uh that did that um that you know send it out to all of their constituents they haven't had any problems yeah you know? well i was sorry bishop sorry I was looking at the um, fact check because I went through all the fact checks um, last night and this morning, and they said there were nine ballots in Pennsylvania where they had a contractor that mistakenly did something. It was it was legitimate what they were saying, and it was nine ballots. It wasn't hundreds of thousands, you know, or anything like that. They weren't in the swamp. They were actually in the mail room, and um, the contractor was terminated because he he did something wrong. I can't quite, I couldn't quite understand exactly what it was. And the only way you know if it has Trump's name on it, you got to open them up to see who's in there. So if you have all these ballots in the swamp, did you, did somebody go in the swamp, take them out, open them up? Oh, these are all Trump. These are, you know, it's just so far fetched. And the thing about it is the people are believing him. Yes. That's the part that I don't get. They believe him. And but he just. Nine. You said nine. Nine. nine it was nine. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It was it nine. Was seven were for him and two were for Biden. Was and and for it Biden. was an honest mistake. It was an Correct. honest mistake. Yes, um, somebody threw them out, you know. So, yeah. He, they, he, weren't, I, they weren't sealed in the inner envelope. And they right. made the rule. Um, the last time because of him that uh, it was something he fought last election. It was something about they have to be sealed in one envelope, witnessed by somebody, and then put in another envelope. Well, right. when they open it, they don't open the sealed envelope, but they open the first envelope to verify that the ballot has been co-signed. If right. the ballot is just in there and it's not co-signed, they have to throw the ballot out because there's no witness saying that Joe Blow was Joe Blow that filled out this ballot. Right. So we have nine that were not double sealed. So actually what he did was right, if you think about it, by literally taking the law that was put in place, but they're blowing it out of proportion. It just so happened that it was more Trumps than Bidens, which just goes to say that I ain't even gonna go there, but we know how to vote. So we know we need to double seal them when we send it back. Absolutely. But I take it a whole different way. I think he just, he feels that if we have to request ballots, that we are not um, an intelligent enough group to send in the request. And that's well, he probably it. thinks we're lazy. Absolutely. And we're not gonna do it. Right. Absolutely. Right, and that's that's the problem. And you know, I do remember uh, them saying that you do have to have that witness. And so, um, you know, I think it's going to go both ways. Some Republican uh, voters are not going to have a witness and not put it in there correct, and some Democratic people. So, you know, that's going to go both ways. But he wanted to make it seem as if it was going to be all stealing from him. And so, you know, <clears throat> it, it's just <laughs> an interesting argument because why not just allow the states to mail them out? If you're on the roster as a voter, you voted in prior elections and prior general elections and prior primary elections, why not just allow the states to mail it out? It makes it so much easier. So Bishop, uh, is, is it that he's afraid that he's going to lose? Is that what he's afraid of? No, he's afraid of losing at this point because <laughs> all of the numbers, the polls keep saying he's trailing it continuously in these um, key states. He was already trailing in some of the other states, but the key states that he needs, he is trailing in those states. And so uh, they are really pressed at this point. But he's but, using the same scare tactic that he used in 2016 about, he said if he loses, then it was rigged. So he's saying the exact same thing, trying to do the exact same scare tactic. You know, we fell for it back then. And now it's like, okay, shorty, we know what's up now. <laughs> But I think he's planting more seeds ahead of time about the possibility of uh, fraudulent things happening with the um, mail-in ballots, um, you know, and saying that he also stated that some of the people that were election judges went to some of the places and they were removed. Okay, well, what were they doing? The reason they were removed. Right. And so, you know, you have to take that with a grain of salt because more than likely they were, um, you know, 
um, trying to, um, you know, aggravate people or doing right. something they should not have done or causing some type of fear, using some type of tactic that they had, you know, worked on or whatever. Uh, so no telling what they were doing, the reason they were removed. So and I also say that the voters should also just remain encouraged because each ballot has a unique identifier for the individual. And yeah. so you're not going to be double counted or triple counted because you have one u unique identifier. And so once again, that's his deflection. That's his approach to telling a story. And unfortunately, it's just always an untruth. <laughs> it's always an untruth. It is. It is because uh, we discovered today at Empowerment Justice Center when we were working um, that you one of the things that Trump threw out, and then we have one last topic. I know we're a few minutes after eight. Uh, one of the topics that, one of the things that Trump threw out was that the um, public safety people were supporting him. And one sheriff or somebody had called him. Mm -hmm. And so he, uh, um, one of the people from that particular area in Portland said that Trump lied on their sheriff because their sheriff had just denounced him publicly and said that he will not support him. And so why Trump chose to use him on national television, I don't know, but it was clear that that particular sheriff had stated he was not supporting Trump. <laughs> another he lies. He's I mean, a liar. He's, he's a liar. liar. So you can't trust He's a lot of things, uh, <laughs> along with being a mental case. <laughs> he, he, he is. He really is. He's got a lot going on with him. And the thing about it is, if you're going to follow him, you got to be questioned too. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> that's the sad thing, uh, Minister Bell. That's the sad thing. All of the different displays and reactions that you could really see live for someone to continue to follow and to support that behavior, the behavior of a kindergartner, is crazy. You know, and so it goes to are you supporting the policies and the laws that this person is, you know, supporting, or are you? supporting this person because of their skin color and because of a particular party that they're associated with. And I think people have gotten into that notion, even black folks, you know, we're Democrats because of X, Y, and Z. Will we ever change? Just some have. Is it right or wrong? That's totally not our, our, our discussion or our right to, to say yeah, nay to. But um, people really just need to think about it and, and be encouraged. Don't have anything deny you or defray you away from voting. Right. Absolutely. And my wife told me, I didn't even know, we used to be more Republican than we were Democrat. Yep. We okay. changed over to be Democrat. So at, at, there was a point where we, we wanted to know what you're standing on. We wanted to know what your platform was. We wanted to know what you were going to do for us. And you had an entire race that was predominantly, if not all, Republican has now transitioned predominantly to the Democrats. So there was a point where we paid attention. We need to pay attention. But the, we really need to pay attention. The Republican Party was a different party when the African Americans uh, were predominantly Republican. That's right. So I heard, I, I think it was on, um, I think it was at the Republican convention. We might've mentioned this. Um, there was an African-American who said that he was Republican because blacks traditionally had been Republican. And I said, well, I couldn't talk to him, but I'm talking to the TV. <laughs> Sir, <laughs> do you not know that when blacks were Republican, things were very different? You have, right. you have entirely different leadership now with the Republican party that stands for different things. They have a different platform. And so now African-Americans have transitioned to become Democrat. And so, you know, don't stay, you stand Republican because blacks had been historically Republican. No, blacks were, um, you know, participating with the Republican party because it was totally different from the party that it is today. And I could, you know, probably say Democrat party, Democratic party is different from, you know, today than what it was many years ago. And so we cannot hold on to those things. Right, right. So for reasons that are not valid. 
And so, you know, maybe there was a reason Herman Cain felt he still needed to be a part of the Republican Party. I don't know. But I also felt last night there was a missed opportunity. This is our last topic, the coronavirus. There was a missed opportunity for Joe to remind Donald Trump, because Donald Trump says that his campaigns, nobody had gotten sick from being at his rallies and those types of things because they're outside. I said, Joe, I was talking to the TV again, you <laughs> bring up Herman Cain. Herman Cain caught COVID at the rally and is now gone. You know, and so we, we have to remind or, or, you know, push Trump into those corners. We know he's going to be upset, but make him, you know, understand that this is on your watch. That's so, right. you know, the last thing is, um, you know, there are some states now that are seeing increases again in coronavirus numbers. And we're so glad we have Deacon Sylvester who always gives us our update, but there's some states that are increasing again. And so Trump last night continued to say, well, Joe, he wants to shut it down. Maybe it does need to be shut down so we can get control of this. You know, and I thought it was a good point what Joe talked about. If you want the schools open, you need to give the schools some money to that's be right. able to clean those classrooms and keep the facilities clean. And that's not what the Republicans want to do. They just want to put the kids in there, not offer them any PPEs and those types of things. Because Joe brought it out. At first, y'all was going to give PPEs. Then you decided not to. Okay, so what do we feel about the now the increase in numbers and the fact that the Republicans are still pushing for states to be fully open and to have people functioning as if the pandemic is over? Well, <laughs> I guess I'll talk. <laughs> well, obviously it, you know, it doesn't take that much of a brain to realize that now that these things are open, you go to the restaurants and you go into concerts and you're doing X, Y, and Z, and you're not wearing your mask, you're not social distancing, you're not doing any of those things, it's the numbers are going to increase. And so, you know, when they were saying, when he has all these rallies, he was like, they're outdoor, outdoor. No, he had rallies indoor also. Uh, yes, but, the thing, but the thing about it is everybody behind him was required to wear a mask. Why was that? Yes, everybody yes. else in front, all, all thousands, all hundred thousands of people, as he said, um, they didn't have to wear a mask. And every state that he has gone to thus far they have increased their numbers in the coronavirus. So it's, I mean, it's like, you can, you can almost tell some, for the most part, you walking down the street and you, you see um, someone that is not of our color and they don't have a mask on. I automatically think that's a Trump supporter, <laughs> automatically. You see us walking down the street we, we walking down the street jogging. Mass. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We jog. We had those shields on now. And, you know, we have our shirts walking down. You, you walk in the grocery store. You still kind of doing like this, you know. But I think it will continue to increase until he finally says, you know, until, first of all, the CDC director makes up his mind and and tells us what we need to do because Trump is telling him what to tell us. So he keeps flip-flopping. But once we wear these masks, I, let me put it this way. All these other countries, their coronavirus, their numbers are so low now. They're yes. so low. You know why? Because they shut it down. Yes. They were, they were, re it was mandated that they wore their masks, that they wore gloves that the, shoot, the schools were closed, all these things, and their numbers are just dwindling, dwindling, dwindling. Ours are still going up, over 204,000 now. Right. Because they're, we are allowed not to wear masks. You know, some stores say you can't come in with masks or whatever the case may be. So but you can't I think with a mask? You, 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 can, you can come in without a mask. Oh, some, wow. store, some stores has it posted, some of them don't. Wow. You know, and, and I think it will continue to drive the numbers up until either we shut it down again, right. wear our masks. You know, the kids, they, why, why, do, why do you want my kid to go to school so bad? We're still working from home. I mean, I understand the issues with getting them online and this, that, and the other, but 
as long as I think that my kid needs to stay home is going to be healthy and I'm going to see that kid the next day, stay home. Yes. You know, so if, if, if we shut it, my opinion is if we shut it down for a certain period of time, whatever the, the correct Fauci or whatever correct CDC person says, we should go along with that. Keep Deacon the people Ronnie, home. Deacon Ronnie, uh, Trump says that the CDC director and I believe the person who's over his uh, committee, they don't know what they're talking about. Remember he said that? Yep, he sure did. Trump said, are you saying that the people are wrong? He said, yes. Right. Yep. yes. But it's you know what? Wrong. Bishop, he, um, um, Vice President Biden, he did <laughs> um, hit him below the knee. He said, oh, you can use a chloroform in your arm and you could do this oh, and that. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. But how are you going to go against the people who are supposedly working to help you to manage, you know, this pandemic? It, it just, oh Lord, anybody else? Want to I, talk I, I just think, oh, I just think, okay. I'm sorry. I just think mine is going to be real quick. I just think Biden did real good talking to somebody that is mental ill, that is mentally ill. You understand? This is like, you know, me sitting with some of my clients who are really at their worst. You know, they have really sparred down and you're trying to ask a question and like, you know, where are you? Do you have any pain from the scale of, uh, of 10 to 1, 10 meaning the most? And they keep saying, what? You know, what? You know, and you, you, you're still trying to have this conversation with this person who are really is really delusional and really just, you know, going over you. And then you say, well, what do you think about you know, the school, and he said, about well, what do you think about your son? You understand, you know, it, 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 it was stressful. You can tell that Biden, when I was watching Ronnie's TV, her, her watch, and I was going in and out, this man was stressed. He was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm, when I leave here, I'm going to go get me something to drink, or I'm going to go light it up somewhere. He want to go to a hookah club or something <laughs> to relax, because dealing with somebody, like when I get off my day and I get off the unit, I got to go and find me. You know, I got to go and do something. And and I can see the stress in this man's face. He was like, what the what? What y'all set me up with? This man is delusional, you know? And that's what I see in this whole thing. It's like, why you argue with somebody who you are really not going to get through? It is really, I mean, you're really not going to get a breakthrough. You're really not going to be a breakthrough. That was his strategy. I think, I think that was just his strategy just to, just to overtalk him so he can't get the point his point out number one i, I sometimes I, I don't think it was um impulsiveness i think it was just a strategy you know um don't let him make any points or anything like that and as far as the mask go it's just it's just turned political you know where it should be a health issue and not a political issue right so, right you know right. but yeah you talk like that all the time dk camp from yeah. the time he got into office. I, 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 but he you can tell like, it was a strategy you, because yeah. when he was quiet for a second, but then when he said Putin's puppy, uh, puppet, puppy, whatever, <laughs> he <laughs> lost it then. He couldn't handle it. So yeah. you can, Exactly. Yeah. That's that mental. You don't know, you say the key word to somebody who's sick. Right. And all of a sudden, you tell a crazy person <laughs> they're crazy, and they hear that crazy word, like, oh, I ain't crazy. You know, then they just, just go all off the chart. You know, and that's what I think it was. And he said the key word, and this man just went ballistic. Anytime, it, it was, the man was stressed. You know, Biden, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I swear, <laughs> I swear to you, I'm praying for your mental health. I'm he serious. Strategy. Uh, his people were unhappy that he did not hit certain points. So, you know, when you talk with the Trump campaign folks or uh, the, you know, people who really want to see him stay in the office, they were not happy because he didn't talk about certain things or did not bring those things up. So yes, it might have been a strategy to keep Joe off, but he was off too because he did not get those things that they wanted him to make sure he said to keep those Republican people, uh, you know, um, I guess engaged and making sure that they were vested in him as their candidate. So he did not make those points for them. Bishop, I have a quick question for everybody. Oh, I'm sorry, Al. No, that's okay. I was just going to say, it's just like being on a playground. When you say something, you know how, well, my brother should kill me with this. I'd say something, they repeat it. Or I say something, they say, I know you are, but what am I? That's exactly what he did for the entire show. I know you are, but what am I? I know. So he was taunting him. And and I agree with him. I think it was a strategy, his own mental strategy. 
I think it was his own strategy to get Joe to get flustered and to stutter and not be able to get his points out. But yeah. see, Joe been practicing his overcoming his disability for too many years. He stuttered and chose a different word. Every time right, he stuttered right. and chose a different I, word. I noticed so his stutter more. more. I, yeah. I'm let him do that. But, when you, but I wanted to go to just a quick thing, Ronnie, on what you said, Bishop, about opening up the schools and opening up the country. One, we don't have enough PPE, period, anyway. But the sad thing about opening up the schools is for whatever reason, that man still said on TV, when we know some of those 208,000 people that died are children. Yes. For him to say yes, I heard. that children are not impacted by this, and I personally know there yes. are children in those numbers. Right. I have a problem with that. And yes. every mother that is at home right now without their child or father or grandmother have a problem too. Yes. That man is out of touch. He's out of touch with everything. Yeah. And nobody can see it because the other people that have been out of touch but had to stay on the perimeter of society because they were so far out of touch have now been invited into the center. And yeah. they're not letting it go. Right. And so that's why we have all this craziness going on. Right. I'm sorry, Dean Ronnie. Right. And so let me piggyback with uh, Minister L um, in terms of the COVID numbers. We're at 7.4 million in the United States because of ignorance and arrogance. Yeah. Based on 45. Yeah. And so how long have the United States been number one in the world with increased exposure cases since early February, if not late January? Yeah. Something has to be done. And Minister L, when you talked about the kids, I actually, the children, I actually looked it up. 624,000 kids in the United States. Confirmed positive cases. That's not a little bit. Wow. At all. At all. And that's yeah. not none. See, he said none. He said right. it does not affect the youth. That is a lot. We know children have 624,000 plus. Thousand. Yes. And that's just infected. That's not the number of that composite that have passed away. That man has no clue. Wow. Wow. Well, Deacon Ronnie, uh, we want to get to your question and then we'll be ready to um, to end. OK, it's, my question is real quick. Do you all think that Biden should participate in the next two debates? Only you think if they're going to call Sandy him Jackson is the person. Would you say it? <laughs> <laughs> the moderate, the moderator, Samuel Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, for moderator, I would pick uh, Joy Reid. Joy Reid. Oh, Joy would light him up. Him. Oh, man. She would yeah. light him yeah. off so quick. Bloop. Yep. Joy Trump would say, good. I need two buttons. I need two buttons right here, complete control. <laughs> Bloop. And then go ahead and finish talking. She would tear him up. Oh, yes. They, oh. Were, they were talking about that. They were talking about that earlier mm -hmm. on um, Morning Joe, um, that maybe Biden shouldn't, if, if, 45 continues to act like a, 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 a buffoon, yeah. then um, he shouldn't participate. Yeah. So I, I feel like if he doesn't participate, then 45 is just going, it's going to be so much, oh, he's afraid of me, or he couldn't handle the last debate, or but he couldn't get his right. talking points, just like right. you all were saying, and he was stuttering, and he was doing this, and he was doing that, you know, so, you know, that's my stance, but that's they were... They're contemplating on whether he should debate for the next two times. That question I was asked yesterday to um, Kamala Harris right after, I think it was on CNN. And she said, absolutely, because one, he owes it to the people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And right. they would not take an opportunity to talk to the people, to inform the people. Right. And so I think right. that, yeah, and I think, think that he will. He, he came um, out today and said that he would. Okay. Um, so I think it was late afternoon. He did come out and talk with the media to say he would. I personally think that he should. Uh, I like the way he talked in the camera on yes. numerous uh, questions to address the people um, since, you know, people couldn't be in the space. Um, but I feel like the only way people are going to continue to get to uh, come to a comfort level with him is that he keeps addressing 
you know, certain things and talking about what the Joe plan is, the Biden plan. I think that's what you call it. So, you know, you've got to continue to get your uh, platform out there and get your points across. And so, you know, um, he, he, you know, is going to have to deal with that. I forgot to say earlier, uh, his people gave him a sedative in one of those other, um, you know, um, um, platforms, I think when he was with Hillary or maybe with uh, all the Republican uh, Party candidates when he was running before, because, you know, he was talking kind of slow. He was kind of laid back. And, you know, I his said, they him dripping. His, his nose, you know, and so I said, they forgot to give him his sedative last night. So I think if they give him a sedative, you know, bring him way down, then, you know, it, it'll be a... <laughs> It'll be a good debate. The one but, thing, did you, <laughs> did you guys notice that no matter how much Chris Wallace admonished him for not following the rules, he never once called him nasty? But let no, there, I didn't notice that. Good point. <laughs> let it, wow. let it, is there, I don't know if the next moderator is a woman or not, or, you know, person of color, but point. he never once said, na he, you know, you're nasty. But, you know, he likes Chris Wallace because Chris Wallace is on Fox. Right. So he likes him. Yeah. But, you know, and I think he just thought that he was having a regular conversation to, to agree to disagree. But Chris Wallace, I'm still the president. So I think he was thinking in that mindset that, I like, well, he, he used to like Fox. Let me just put it like that. He used to like Fox, but now Fox is coming out with the wrong polling. But Chris Wallace has um, interviewed him several times. So he likes Chris Wallace. So I think that's where that kind of respect came from, Kim. Yeah, I just think, I'm yeah, sorry. Well, I just think that he should do it. You know, just like Deacon Sylvester said, he, did, he um, you know, owed to the people to speak about what needs to happen, but I just think that he needs to like practice a little bit, you know, maybe get two kids with ADHD and somebody that has another type of, you know, extra energy so he can talk while they're talking to see if he can stay focused because all of that noise he getting and that, and that baby stuff that he got last night, you know, maybe he'll be able to tolerate it a little better and be able to go forth and he can, you know, put three, you know, seven-year-olds up there and let him just talk off the, the crap and just see if he because you have to be prepared for somebody like him you know with all of that nonsense that he give and stuff like that so he won't be stressed out and that Biden will be able to stand up and move forth and ask the question that the moderator is asking and get a moderator like you said Bishop that is going to bleep him off because I kept saying why can't they turn his mic off I mean that's like inappropriate behavior you know, you display it to the world. Like, can somebody shut him down or turn him off or, you know, let me get mad and leave if you want to leave. But, you know, there should have been some type of control there with that. And it's unfair to Biden because he realized that he was like, okay, well, I'm standing here alone trying to deal with this person who have five personalities and just talking out of turn and all over the place, you know? It, it was it was really crazy. You well, y'all know, so. know how you all know how they did the. Um, they were preparing the people to go sit at the counters, and they were talking to talking to them, and they was throwing the milk mm -hmm. on them and spitting at them. That's what they need to do for Biden to get him prepared for the next debate. Yeah. Or right. they need him to prepare for Kamala. Or they need him to prepare for Kamala. Kamala would have had a comeback. <laughs> Kamala would have had a comeback. Exactly. If he would have said something about his son, Kamala would have said, well, my son ain't running for president. And would have kept on going. She would have had something to come but back. But everybody, do y'all know who's going to be back? Are we, we ready seen, for- We all seen Trump kids, right? Are we ready for the vice president? Yeah, uh, now. Today? Can't wait for her to tear it up. I can't, I can't, I can't wait either. for her to tear Pence down. Oh, yeah. Oh, she gonna, oh, she gonna serve him up on a platter, honey. But Ooh, you know what? It's going, of course, it's gonna be a lot calmer because Pence is is he has as much personality as this thing that. right here, you know. <laughs> so it's gonna be a whole lot calmer. And but I, I, I really feel like Kamala Harris is very sharp. Yes, she is. And her responses are going to, I think, are going to blow your mind. Right. Yeah. She's a good listener, so she, she yes. knows how to respond. Exactly. Right. The only thing I see with that is that, you know, you're dealing with a misogynistic group. Uh, and um, and that's, I forgot to talk about the Amy Barrett religious group. I forgot all about that to bring that up. 
That's sweet. <laughs> right, right. We need a part two. We need a part two. Part two. Uh, but, you know, you're dealing with um, a person who makes sure his wife is always present. I understand he cannot have any meetings or do any dis public displays without her. And so she must always be there. And I don't know if that's a security blanket or what that is, but you know. Does nobody uh want him? <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, minute, wait, wait. So I'm on the same page. You're talking about 45. No, I'm talking no, about- No, uh, Biden. I mean, Pence. Oh, yeah. okay. okay. Yeah. And so, you know, with that, uh, what is his attitude? And, you know, is it going to be, uh, you know, he is not taking her seriously, like we know when Trump debated with Hillary Clinton. And it was very uh, out of um, uh, presidential posture to stand up and say crooked Hillary, blah, 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 you know, on last evening, you know, I just, he, he really needs to get himself together. But I just want, you know, to, um, Think about us to think about is Pence going to respect her as a dynamic woman that she is, who has made headway in history in a lot of uh, different areas in our country, or is he going to treat her as if uh, she's um, beneath him? Let me say it that way. He may try, but yeah, let's see, see. not that woman. That's you good, yeah. can try, but see, some, there's there's something about women of her her vein that you can try anything you want to tear them down. They still come back so even and on point that it's a waste of time. And, and it makes Ronnie you said it us. We're not our ancestors. Yes, that's and what's going to happen. <laughs> Mr. Eliana, do you think that's DNA, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Absolutely DNA. But yeah, I don't think he's... And then I also, I think, for me, he's never seemed like a strong person. No. Um, and I don't care how much you prepare a person that's not strong, it's still preparation. Her responses and the way she shows up, it's natural. Just like she went running off that airplane with her Tims on. It's natural. That's who she is. That's who yeah. she is. Yes, yes, yes. Well, this has been a great night uh, of talking uh, with our ELC leadership. We've had powerful, powerful discussion. Uh, please do make sure once again, you hit like, please make sure you share this live feed and go back and create a watch party. Talk with your friends about these things. Make sure if you did not watch the presidential debate, you know, uh, as we talked about sedatives, you might need one to get through the whole thing. <laughs> But we want you to go back and watch it uh, and make sure you know what uh, each candidate stands for and what their platforms are. Again, this Sunday, we will have World Communion Sunday at Empowerment Liberation Cathedral. So join us at 11 o'clock as we participate with the uh, Potomac Association of the United Church of Christ. And we will have a beautiful service for you at 11 a.m. on Facebook Live, as well as on YouTube. And you can also watch it on our church website. Thank you so much for tuning in and don't forget to vote. Those of you who are early voting, vote. yeah, we want you to early vote. Those of you who got your ballots, I believe uh, Prince George's County and Maryland are sending out ballots now and all um, places across the country are sending out absentee ballots. So make sure you complete those ballots and whatever it is you need to do, make sure you do it to make sure it's legitimate uh, when you send it back in that it's validated. Okay, so we want to end by saying remember to vote and may God keep you, may God bless you, and may God continue to cover you as you um, you know go through this uh, journey and this pandemic. And please remember to give to Empowerment Liberation Cathedral. I did forget that during this justice time, I've been uh, doing uh, these fabulous, wonderful, um, you know, insightful panels, but I forgot to say, you know, that you can give to us at Dallas Sign ELC Church, or you can give on Givelify. May God continue to bless you, keep you, and cover you in all.